Hi, my name is Lauren Templeton, and you are listening to Investing the Templeton Way. This podcast is for anyone interested in learning more about investing. In this podcast, I will be interviewing some of the greatest minds from the investment community and exploring topics ranging from international markets to behavioral finance. To learn more, please visit us at investingthetempletonway.com. The information presented in this podcast or available on the website is not intended as and shall not be construed as financial advice. This podcast is produced for entertainment value. Investing is inherently risky, and I encourage you to seek financial advice from a professional who is aware of the facts and circumstances of your individual situation. Thanks for listening. Welcome to Investing the Templeton Way podcast. I'm your host, Lauren Templeton. And I'm your co-host, Scott Phillips. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting a truly remarkable guest, Lawrence Cunningham, a leading authority on corporate finance, um, corporate governance, finance, and investing. Mr. Cunningham is an exceptional scholar, author, and professor who has left an indelible mark on the world of business and academia. With a career spanning decades, Lawrence Cunningham has garnered widespread acclaim for his invaluable contributions to the field of corporate governance. As a professor emeritus at George Washington University Law School and a former faculty, faculty member at esteemed institutions like Boston College and Cordoza Law School, he has had a profound impact on shaping the minds of future business leader, leaders. Lawrence Cunningham has authored numerous critically acclaimed books, including The Essays of Warren Buffett, Lessons for Corporate America, Dear Shareholder, Berkshire Beyond Buffett, Margin of Trust, which he co-authored with his wife, and Quality Investing, Owning the Best Companies for the Long Term. His writings have become essential reading for anyone seeking to gain a deep understanding of these intricate subjects. Welcome, Larry, to the podcast. Thank you very much, Lauren and Scott. That was an extremely generous introduction. I appreciate that. Well, I had a longer one penned, actually, but your bio is so long and you have had so many accomplishments, it's hard to fit them all in, but we'll make sure the complete bio is posted to the website and show notes for readers who are interested. So we met you in person, or Scott did, many years back. You thought it was in what year, Scott? Probably around 2013. At the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting, where we recorded an interview with you. Um, so it's wonderful to have you back and a new interview. Can you start by telling our audience a little bit about how you got started? Your background is in law. What brought you into the Berkshire Hathaway world? Were you focusing on corporate governance? Tell me a little bit about your past. Thanks. It was really the intersection of corporate governance and investing where Warren spends a lot of his brain power and his writings highlight that intersection. Both as an investor, he cares a great deal about stewardship and only invests with people he likes, trusts, and admires. And, and that gets into the boardroom. That's it's really the essence of, of, of corporate governance. Uh, and then as a manager, as he began acquiring companies and grew and grew, um, his own uh, imperative was to design a corporate governance system that would enable, enable administration of that sprawling um, conglomerate that has continued to grow. Uh, and he emphasizes the, the importance of, of trust in, in his decentralized autonomous structure. So Corporate governance and investing sort of overlap in that way. And, and I came onto it as a young uh, professor of corporate governance. Um, my, prof my teacher uh, knew Warren and um, they worked together on a, uh, a plain English uh, for, for companies project. Uh, many disclosure documents, prospectuses and annual reports were written in terrible <laughs> legalese and people didn't understand it and, and wouldn't find it interesting. So um, 
Warren was on a panel that tried to improve the, the quality of disclosure in corporate America. And my professor was on that with him. And so um, my professor introduced me to Warren and his letters, and they just blew me away. Uh, the clarity, the candor, and, and the, art, the articulated link between corporate governance and investing. And so um, I just fell in love with the letters and have been, been a big fan, a big student of them ever since. Yeah, it's amazing. There is so much clarity in his letters, and I think that helps him attract that quality shareholder base. We all respond to that. I mean, I often f feel like, well, actually, this year I took both of my girls to the AGM, and on the airplane going out there, I pulled out the annual report and handed it to my oldest daughter. And she sat there on the plane and read the letter at the beginning of the report. And she's 14. So she was able to read it and understand a lot of it. So he does write in a very clear and simple, easy to understand format. What other CEOs do you find um, are accomplished in this area and skilled at writing investor letters? Uh, th thanks for the question, Laura. And I, I actually um, did a lot of research on, on exactly that question. I read hundreds or maybe nearly a thousand um, different authors, different CEOs um, letters to shareholders over a long period of time and um, analyzed the, their clarity, their candor, both using some of my own tests as, as well as uh, the tests of uh, linguistic analysts who, who, uh, who are experts in, in identifying clear prose and understandable language. And I boiled it down to about 100 and then dug a little deeper and came up with 20 and then published a book uh, called Dear Shareholder, The Best CEO Letters. Uh, and the subtitle is going to answer your question. Uh, and I think it said from Prem Watson to Warren Buffett. Um, so Prem Watson is the chairman and CEO of Fairfax Financial, which I know that you know well, a terrific uh, Toronto-based international insurance company and in merchant in investment vehicle. Uh, has a lot in common with Berkshire, uh, including that Prem Watson is a skillful communicator, um, you know, witty, clear, uh, honest, uh, just uh, and, and educational. His his letters also inform. Uh, another so so that book um, has fifteen or twenty uh, CEOs in there. Jeff Bezos is in there, the CEO of, of Amazon, um, former CEO, I guess, but. For, for many years, he wrote uh, clear, crisp, um, inspiring uh, letters, to, you know, talking about the business principles that um, Amazon was based on, especially customer centricity, um, the sense of a very long term uh, horizon. Uh, you know, day one is, is his sort of mantra about, you know, always, always thinking you're starting something new and you're, you're going for uh, a marathon. Um, uh, but well, Warren's letters take the cake, and, and it's hard hard to emulate him. But but there are those uh, those uh, those twenty or so, and I I do commend um, those to you because I think the other thing about, the other test that we applied when selecting those twenty was sort of a uh, an authenticity test. You know, there are a lot of ghost written letters that look and sound good, but but are not genuine, and you can see it either in the the, the tenure of the leader. Uh, the performance of the underlying business. Um, and so what's true about this collection of letters is they're written by people who really mean it, uh, mean what they say, and and live it. Um, you know, they are in the saddle for a long time. Not every year is great, but over long periods of time, they've, they've tended to uh, do very well for their shareholders. What is your favorite investor letter you've ever read? Oh, well, it's pro probably Warren, Warren Buffett's uh, 1978 letter re relatively short um and this was early days for berkshire as a public company warren had been writing letters to the partners of the buffett partnership for 15 or so years but this is the first time he's he's really addressing a public shareholder constituency and in that letter he described the kinds of shareholders he wanted to attract to Berkshire Hathaway. He called them quality shareholders. Um, and he went on to explain what that meant. And the short version of what it meant was he wanted people who really cared about Berkshire Hathaway 
understood the business, wanted to take the time to learn about its philosophy, uh, its methods, um, its investment strategy, um, and and who would then want to own the the company, own shares in the company indefinitely for ever, essentially. Uh, and so he he elaborated this framework at you know you rarely. I'd like to see more CEOs want that kind of shareholder, and there are share there are CEOs who do, and um, I'd also like to see more shareholders who who are like that, who 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 study and hold. Um, but that's the kind of shareholder he said he wanted in the beginning. And that letter, uh, the reason I value it so highly, out of all the uh, encyclopedias of, of letters out there, is. Um, you know, it was a direct appeal, it was a, a very specific advertisement to a very particular kind of person uh, who was invited to join this uh, very unusual business organization. Um, so, and it's worked. Uh, <laughs> so it was an invitation that was accepted uh, by uh, those to whom it was issued. Uh, mostly, and has has generally worked. Yeah, it's such a fascinating case study, Berkshire Hathaway, and the the qualities of the shareholders. I mean, you can feel it at the meeting when you're standing there with forty thousand people. They're you know mostly shareholders, <laughs> we hope, um, and they all seem very similar. Um, they're all very humble and I think very educated. Um, it's an interesting group of people, but I've heard you describe shareholders. You you have four categories that you put shareholders in. Could you expand a little bit on that, and um, how 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 many quality shareholders are out there? I'm happy to. Uh, and I, the the four categories um, that, that that you mentioned that I, I guess I came up with them. I came up with them in certain ways, but in in some ways I, I just drew upon a fairly um, rich uh, academic literature that tries to segment uh, the shareholder universe, as well as a um, a more popular uh, conception or delineation uh, written by a number of different investors uh, over a fairly long period of time, starting uh, with Phil Fisher in his 1958 book called uh, Common Stocks and, and Uncommon Profits. And so this it's a pretty vast literature, um, both in the academic side and the, the sort of popular side. And it, it basically and, and there are a lot of different ways we could cut the, the shareholder universe. But the, the, what this um, uh, literature, this framework stresses is a shareholders time horizon and degree of concentration or, or diversification. Uh, and so you, you could picture those two dimensions uh, as the sort of the X and Y axis on on a graph, um, uh, time horizon, short to forever, <laughs> short to short, nanoseconds to infinity, uh, and concentration to diversification. You know, running from you know a single stock, let's say, to uh, the entire Russell three thousand or or some larger larger index. And if you just divide that uh, graph in, into four, you'll get basically the four uh, types that we're uh, talking about. So you have a um, uh, uh, an index fund, for example, which is um, ba basically forever, ba basically um, uh, lo as long term as you can be. Um, certainly, they don't um, try to time the market and buy and sell really quickly. They, they basically intend to hold forever, subject only to having to to buy and sell in order to maintain the proportional interest in the index. So they're very long term uh, and also extremely diversified. They're, by definition, um, a, a person running an index um, fund is uh, as diversified as you can be in that index, whether it's the S&P 500 or, or the Russell uh, something. And so you've got that, that cohort, very long term, very diversified. And you've got the, the flip of that uh, is a very... Um, arbitrage or short-term uh, opportunistic uh, trader could be using artificial intelligence and doing nanosecond trading, uh, very in and out, uh, or day trading at, at your at your desk at home. Um, uh, but it's the opposite long-term. Have no interest really in the underlying business. Um, uh, you're only trying to exploit the scorecard, exploit the uh, you know, the, the trading. 
Uh, and, and that cohort, you know, may, may or may not have uh, v- very concentrated positions, but, and, and probably does, it's just, you know, bu- buying a large <laughs> position, uh, but not holding it uh, for very long at all. And, and we, we, there are different nicknames for that, that cohort. Some people just call them traders, others transients or arbitrageurs or, or something like that. But uh, I, I call them transients in, in, in my work. Um, so those are those, and, and those two cohorts are a pretty big portion of uh, trading or investing today. Um, the index community probably commands uh, 40, at least 40% of the total market equity. Certainly the big three, you know, <laughs> own 20 or together own 20 or more percent of most uh, public companies in North America, more in, America, more in the United States than in Canada, but still a huge portion. And then a lot of additional smaller index funds are out there. So they, it's a huge, powerful block. And again, they, they may be long term. They're certainly not trying to do short term stuff, uh, but they're so diversified uh, that they can't really pay attention to particular businesses like, like say, Berkshire Hathaway. And the other cohort of transients, it's, it's a little harder to measure exactly the total capital that they command. But if you look at average trade, average holding periods and um, and, and different funds. They're also a very substantial, it's a, a very large portion of, of stock is is held and, and traded by people or I- institutions with relatively short time horizons, certainly less than a year. And a lot of it's, you know, six months or, or less. So maybe it's 30 or 40%. Um, the, the, the third category are um, a, a kind of a hybrid, I guess, um, we'll call them activists. In investors, activists, shareholders, um, and they're they're a little different because they 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 can st- and the population is diverse. Some of them are are, are quite long term, um, but but some of them are more of a drive by operation where they they just seize an opportunity, try to drive the price, stock price up and and split. Um, so it's a it's a little a little different category. They're certainly not indexing. Um, and they're probably not nano trading, but but and they're you know using their position to try to exert influence, and so in a certain way they are concentrated and focused uh, on the on the business. Uh, and the fourth category, this is the quality shareholder category that Buffett in 1978 said he wanted to attract at Berkshire Hathaway. They're unlike the indexers or the transients. They're basically the opposite of of both of them. Unlike uh, the the transients, this cohort buys and holds or intends to hold forever uh it has very very long time horizon it, it, it's it, in berkshire's case it's infinite it's it's forever you know 20 30 years We're talking about generational wealth but but even funds or investors that are thinking three five ten years would would count as long term uh in this model so if their average holding period is is multiple years um we put them in the box of of long term, and the other feature of the quality shareholders, unlike the index, is that they tend to concentrate their portfolio in a relatively smaller number of uh, of investments. Instead of owning all five hundred companies in the S and P, they might own as few as twenty or or thirty or or forty. But it's a focused portfolio selected based on the economic uh, and cultural characteristics of particular companies. So th- that's the quality shareholder cohort. That's the group Warren has always wanted to attract since 1978. It's it's certainly a good description of Berkshire Hathaway. Um, they have a very concentrated portfolio, uh, and their favorite holding period is forever. Uh, and so, what por- portion of the total universe is represented by the, the these two cohorts? The, the activist cohort can vary from three to seven or nine percent, depending on activity levels and so on. But so it's relatively small as an overall, but they have they have a lot of weight and so exert a lot of influence. And the quality shareholder cohort makes up the rest. It may be as, small, as few as 10%, maybe 20%, depend, depending on depending on how you count, but it's no no greater than that. Um, so it's, it's a minority for sure. Um, but the thing about them is that because of their focus, because they do their homework and they study companies very carefully, they actually have uh, they contribute more value um, to the process of capital allocation, market pricing, and so on than the other courts uh, do. So it's a small but critical 
uh, cohort for the overall system. And then for companies like Berkshire, just uh, why does Warren want that cohort? He wants people who are interested in Berkshire and, and, and want to hold it forever. That's, that's the 40,000 people who, uh, hopefully your yeah. daughter, uh, who, are, who are coming to the meeting, people who know Fingers the company crossed. And, and are prepared to hold it. Uh, through thick and thin. Well, I can imagine that cohort is shrinking and has been shrinking over time. So what are the implications? Um, corporate governance implications? I mean, what what should we expect? I, I think they're profound. You're, you're exactly right. The quality shareholder cohort has been shrinking. And uh, strikingly, um, in, in 1978, when, when Warren wrote that letter, um, the transient cohort was robust. It always has been. There are lots of there, there are a lot of people who are very excited to play the stock market, and that, that typically means thinking of of stocks as pieces of paper or dollars that, that simply trade and are fun. You know, is, speculators just fun, and they're not really thinking about you know what's the long term uh, approach to uh, this manufacturing business or this service or this product. They're, they're just trying to make a buck, and so they've always prowled the markets and. They were probably as numerous in, in 78 as they are today. I mean, there, there's some evidence that average holding periods have been have been shortening, um, but there's also some evidence that it's not so bad. So I, I'm not as uh, exercised about about that um, short termism. Uh, it's it's real, but I don't think any worse. But in, in 1978, there were very few index uh, funds. They, those things were invented early 70s. They began to to um, um, take root. Um, Jack Bogle famously uh, originated the idea. Um, he, he's the fellow who eventually founded Vanguard, and he, he wrote he his the idea he art, he articulated in his um, uh, graduate thesis at Princeton University, and where he outlined kind of why why this would be attractive um, to uh, an investor or, or manager to own the index, and he explained that it's because you don't have to do any homework. You don't have to incur any cost to learn about particular businesses. Uh, you don't even really put, you don't even really face any any meaningful risk of particular businesses. You're simply acquiring uh, the market return at no or low cost and whatever risk that presents, high or low. Um, and so it, he explained it's a wonderful uh, device for millions of ordinary people who don't have to think. And don't have to pay much, and and yeah, you'll have a bad year every once in a while. But last year it was, you know, negative eighteen percent. But most of the time you're, yeah, six, eight, nine, eleven. Uh, so, so Jack and others in the '70s incubated this industry, uh, and and by '78 it was probably too soon to see that this would now become, you know, forty percent of the market. But, but even at that time, I think I think Warren was worried. Uh, but the reason. The quality cohort is shrinking is is because of the allure of, of the index. It's it's just a lot easier um, and safer, not only for the, the the avowed indexers like like Vanguard, uh, but for money managers who are scared of underperforming, who will be punished if they make the wrong picks on their concentrated stock. And so Career you've rest. got this pressure uh, to. Uh, pretend like you're doing real investing, but actually delivering the market. You know, it's called closet indexing, uh, and it just it accretes. You know, more and more uh, people migrate in, in, in that direction, and I, savers. I mean, ordinary uh, re people preparing for retirement find that a very attractive uh, proposition. It's very low cost. You know, you get the market. Yes, Warren Buffett even advocates for it. He said, he said that they, yeah, exactly. They, that the he calls it the rocking chair investor, or, or more, more, more negatively, the know nothing investor, or someone who doesn't have the time, energy, ability to evaluate a Fairfax or a Berkshire or an Amazon. Just buy Van, you know, buy the S and P five hundred from 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 Vanguard. So yeah, he said that. So it's extremely uh, uh, valuable. It's extremely powerful, valuable. The, the downside is that. Because the um, investing model entails doing no homework and not really knowing anything, uh, that same group then gets to vote on very important consequential decisions that companies have to make, including electing the directors annually and setting a lot of the governance guidelines, like whether the CEO and the chair should be the same or different people, whether diversity should be a priority and what, what that would mean, uh, whether certain kinds of 
lines of business should be off limits or embraced. Um, and so what's been happening uh, over the past 20 years is this important decisions like that in corporate America are increasingly made by people who really don't have the time, energy, or attention to study them. <laughs> and so what the, the consequence is that we have guidelines that all of the large index funds and their the external advisors, um, be, because they can examine every company, company by company, do what Warren wanted people to do for first year, uh, they just have general lists of rules that every company is expected to follow, such as the chair and the CEO should be split. A majority of the board should be independent. Every person on certain committees should be independent. Um, there shouldn't be any blank check preferred stock. There shouldn't be any cumulative voting. There shouldn't be a dual class capital structure. Just on and on, just a list of rules. Uh, cookie because, cutter corporate governance. Yeah, it's I call, yeah cookie cutter corporate governance. And you know, in 1978, this was not a serious problem because Vanguard might have had a vote at you know one percent or two percent, if that. Um, you know, the collection of index funds, a, a very tiny say in the matter. These days, you know, at, at 20, 30 or 40 uh, percent, this this cohort, the indexing cohort of shareholders has enormous and I would I, power and I'd call it inordinate power because the entire business model is premised on being um, you know, homework free, uh, you know, very passive. Uh, and they simply don't have, you know, the economics don't support the, the necessary resources to do the fundamental analysis. Now, to be fair, they, they do attempt to deploy a staff of, of uh, 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 engagement managers. They call them stewardship staff, but it's really trying trying to identify relevant facts at particular companies that would warrant a deviation from the from the from the rule book. Uh, which is a nice gesture, but it, it's it's not the same. You you still have a lot of very um, re reflexive uh, voting on on extremely important matters that that the, the quality shareholders take a totally different approach. <laughs> they, they, they do thorough examination uh, of of the of the governance structure, the, who the directors are, what the strategy is. Um, they they listen carefully. Um, and they don't always, you know, they don't always go along. Sometimes they'll say this is, ship is going in the wrong direction, and they they will sell. But in but they're doing their homework, and and so those are those are the categories. Uh, and I do think I'll just finish with one one uh, caution, you know, uh, 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 cautionary note that Jack Bogle, the fellow I said, uh, basically invented the index fund, um, passed away about two years ago. Uh, and he was a very public spirited figure. He wrote a lot of books and gave a lot of speeches and um, commend his his work to you all. And he wrote uh, op eds in newspapers. And, and a lot of what he did was advocate for um, index funds. And and, uh, uh, and and fact, and Warren Buffett loved Jack. Uh, I don't think they were super close friends, but Warren thought Jack Bogle was a hero to ordinary investors for having invented the index fund. So Jack loved the index fund. But nevertheless, his last Op-ed, the last editorial public-spirited contribution that he made about eight months before he died, um, warned about the excessive concentration of power in the indexing industry. He observed that Vanguard, State Street, and BlackRock, the, the, they called the big three in the indexing industry, command the voting power of 20 to 25 percent of every large company in America and, and many elsewhere in the world. And what does that mean? Why is it scary? Well, because the decision makers at those three firms, it's just a handful of people, three or four individuals at each of those places are deciding um, all directors should be independent. No CEO can be the chair. No one can have prefer blank check preferred. I mean, all these other, it's just a handful of people. Uh, and Jack's warning was that even the most what the wisest, <laughs> best intention um, group of 12 people should probably not be trusted with, <laughs> you know, the, the, the most consequential uh, decisions um, in the civilization. So that was Jack's warning. And and I take it seriously. And, uh, and uh, you know, I'm, I think some of the leaders at the index funds appreciate that, too. And they're, they're trying to take steps to 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 reallocate some of that concentrated voting power back to the actual investors, but it's a it's a huge, um, I think, uh, shortcoming in the in the prevailing uh, governance system. 
Yeah, I mean, I I think it's very concerning, um, the proxy voting firms and the consolidation of power there and some of the recommendations that you see coming out of the proxy voting firms that don't seem to be very well informed about the particular circumstances giving a company, um, you know, in, impacting a certain company. I think it's very concerning. Yeah, and it, incidentally, your readers might be interested in a report that was prepared by a, a group called the Society for Corporate Governance. It's a professional association. Um, it's about 80 years old it, it, of, of the general counsels and corporate secretaries of, of the largest, you know, say the Fortune 500 uh, in America. So these are people on the front lines of engaging on corporate governance, including with those proxy advisor firms and, and the institutional in, investors. And um, they, they do a lot of um, reports and, and studies and research about um, practices, trends, problems. And, and one exercise they produced last year cataloged the errors that the proxy advisor firms had based their recommendations upon. Errors about the, the background of a director, whether the director had X number of other board seats, and how long the director had been in the office, uh, how old the director was, whether the director had done any consulting for the companies, reams and reams and reams of mistakes. Uh, <clears throat> we're all human. We all make mistakes. The, the problem here is, is there's not there's no mechanism to correct them. The, the, the practice in that community is for the proxy advisor to uh, you know make sort of run through its data and then you know produce the recommendations and leave it at that. So when a company discovers there's a mistake, th this director isn't on that other board. This director never consulted for us. Uh, there's no way to fix it. And so you just get a lot of mistakes. I think you can attach a letter to the recommendation somehow. I, like I've run into this circumstance in the, in the past where you can attach a letter, but they will not change the recommendation after it's been made, even if it was made based on incorrect information. Um, so that is a bit disturbing as well. <laughs> yeah, maybe the fact checking is a is a job for AI. We'll see. <laughs> One question I had, Larry, while you were we were discussing the kind of erosion of quality shareholding. Do you think that there's a correlation between that uh, evolution and the last ten years of monetary policy, low interest rates, and the advent of speculation and the homogenization of interest costs at the company level to where it just made more sense to own the index. And if that is true to some degree, is it a good sign that interest rates are going back up and companies are starting to disaggregate in their performance? And will that create more shareholder interest? Yeah, I, I, that's an, it's an excellent point. You've, you've said it better, better than I can, but cer certainly, uh, investors or anybody trying to allocate capital respond to um, the macroeconomic environment, the interest rate environment, and uh, will take decisions, um, you know, based, you know, influenced by uh, the, the rate of interest, uh, the cost of capital. And I, I think your thesis is uh, credible about the past decade, and, and I suppose uh, it, it will probably alter some some incentives and provoke a more uh, you know fundamental analysis among uh, certain cohorts. So I'd say yes. Uh, my only hesitancy is that you know it doesn't uh, you know the allure of the index remains you know powerful and strong because just you don't have to do it. You know it's arm arm rocking chair investing, uh, so anybody can do it. Um, so I think the allure won't, won't completely disappear. And that from my uh, be, uh, armchair policy advice, I, I think monetary policy is critical. But I think we, I think, I think working on the mechanism to um, uh, calibrate the voting power with with the sort of the homework. Uh, you know, so the business model is let's do no homework, uh, and and we'll all get the index. That's fine. But then I, I don't think you can then also um, fairly claim that you get the voting power. You're not doing, it just doesn't seem logical. And obviously, there's nothing illegal about anything that's been done. But, but I think that the, the invention, uh, uh, the, the system didn't adjust entirely for the invention. I think we still have to do that work. And, and, and again, there are proposals galore about how, how to do it. 
and some of the funds are trying to self-regulate, uh, but there are proposals in Congress and there, there are proposals in state legislatures to try to try to change the, the power of the index voting and, and, and the proxy plumbing, as, it, as it's called, the, the, the process through which these votes are, are cast and, and, and oust directors or, or effect other changes. And so I think, I think we really need to work on that, e even if um, uh, interest rates stabilize or, or, or people are, in, are otherwise incentivized to, to focus on fundamentals. I, I think that, that mismatch between you know, what the index does as an economic matter and what it's able to do as a policy governance matter need to be uh, yeah. adjusted. Has there been some uh, blowback on the role of the ETF providers in, in proxy voting? I'm thinking particularly along the lines of ESG and maybe that there's a growing awareness of their power. Yeah, I think that's exactly right, Scott. Um, because... It, the indexers had a problem in the beginning, say 20 or so years ago. They, they began to have this governance authority, this governance power, and they didn't really know what to do with it. And the solution was to promulgate these guidelines, these proxy voting guidelines that announced our expectations around the, the various governance points that, that I've been listing, you know, board size, makeup, um, relationships, roles, and stuff like that. And it wasn't a terrible design. Um, I, I think it's full of flaws, but it, it wasn't a disaster. They 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 found some academic studies and, and here or there, or some intuitions that said, you know, having independent directors is probably helpful for uh, you know financial reporting, if if nothing else. Having an audit committee uh, with independent people and some authority over the auditors is probably a good idea to promote fidelity and financial reporting. So it wasn't a, and even even separating the chair and the CEO. The evidence is mixed, but it wasn't a, wasn't an irresponsible <laughs> idea. We were still trying to focus on what's the best for this company in running this business for the benefit of the shareholders. So it wasn't entirely out of whack. But as the ESG movement gained power on its own and, and gained momentum and, and entered into these, these not just governance, but environmental uh, behavior and, and reporting and social behavior and reporting, particularly how uh, in the workforce, how recruiting, retention, promotion, training, and, and so on is done. Uh, it's a whole new world. It, it's deep into the interior functioning and operations of a company. So where we put the plant, how we manage the pollution, uh, how we um, sequester the carbon, uh, you know, who we hire and in what geographies and what mix and of gender, of race, of religion, and so on. And that's deep inside the operations of the company. What in the world would index funds know about that? And where where would they get their their guidelines? Um, I mean, it's it's governance was you know okay, a, a bit of a can of worms, but but it wasn't uh, you know it was very much about the administration of the organization rather than its internal operations. You know, when it's come to E and e S. You know, and in the early days of that movement, it was it was also well intentioned and, and actually probably benign. Um, it's an old-fashioned thing to the, the way you make money for your stockholders is by catering to your customers and nurturing your employees. So it's and protecting the community, including the earth. So it's in some ways innocent, but in the past five years, um, an enormous um, ecosystem has just gotten behind that and pushed it in some cases to extremes that have nothing to do with the performance of particular companies, um, but instead try to ad advance much larger social or environmental uh, agendas that have become increasingly controversial on their own in the political sphere. Um, uh, and then within particular companies, it, it's just become a bit combustible. And so you've gotten a very significant backlash or uh, resistance or repudiation to some of these more extreme overtures. Uh, and yes, all engines in the field have um, felt the blowback, including the index funds, who they've been asked to, to vote on, well, should, um, well, let's take Berkshire Hathaway. This year, there was one proposal, a governance proposal to split the CEO and chair role. But there was another one about, uh, it's been on the ballot for several of the past few years, um, please report your carbon emissions from all of your operations and those of your customers and those of your suppliers. 
Please report the diversity, the, the, the gender and racial makeup of your employees across all these businesses. And, you know, in Ber- Berkshire says these are not practical or effective strategies to promote ecology or diversity at the complex, diverse, decentralized, autonomous organization that we have. They try to explain this. Um, but again, the quality shareholders would study that debate, which is an interesting debate, uh, and, and then and make a resolution based on the particular facts at Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, but the indexers are ill-prepared to do that, so they, they simply instead have a guideline that says we're in favor of environmental reporting, we're in favor of diversity reporting, without, without evaluating whether this is appropriate for this company or even helpful to the ultimate causes that the agenda is, is seeking. So uh, that you're exa- exactly right. A, a, a very big light has been shown on this aspect of corporate administration. And it's, it's hard to predict how it will resolve. But if you look back at history, we've had six different social, corporate social responsibility movements uh, since the 30s and 40s. And they follow a pattern where uh, good ideas initially make some uh, productive uh, adjustments. Uh, and, and then the success attracts zealots <laughs> and extremists who push too far and a backlash ensues and you return to s- some sort of equilibrium. And I, I think ESG may be in, in, in the process of finding that equilibrium. Yeah, it feels like there's a backlash right now against ESG. It's such an interesting topic for me to talk about as a female on three corporate boards. Um, The whole diversity on board component, you know, I see the value of having a diverse, diverse board. Of course, that's probably one of the reasons I'm serving on some of the boards that I serve on. But then also the absurdity of, um, voting against the nominating and corporate governance chair because there aren't exactly, you know, one third of the women on the board, um, not exactly one third of the people on the board are women. So I see the absurdity in that. And it's a really hard, um, it's a hard thing to tackle. I think that's why these shareholder letters are so important, because if you have a CEO that can communicate very clearly and directly to shareholders, and a CEO that has cultivated that trust, both within the organization, among the executives, and among shareholders, shareholders will actually listen to that CEO explain these issues and what is best for the company. And it sounds like you think that um, Warren Buffett is just a great example of somebody who does that very effectively. Yeah. And, and you make, I agree. Uh, you're right uh, about my my views on that. And I think um, that, that Dear Shareholder book that we, we mentioned um, a little earlier also gave examples of some um, female CEOs who excel or have excelled at at letter writing. Um, We had Pepsi, uh, HP, I think it was Meg Whitman, and Catherine Graham, and I single, at Washington Post Company, I single her out because uh, she and Buffett, Warren Buffett, had a a very uh, productive symbiotic uh, business relationship where um, Berkshire became a significant shareholder in Washington Post Company, um, who was public, and, you know, she cultivated that quality shareholder, and then he helped uh, strategize and uh, mentor, I guess, uh, Kay Graham, and also gave very useful technical advice on certain topics like how to manage their company pension fund. Um, but Kay, she was remarkably candid and clear, so she's an exemplar. Um, and to, to, yeah, and you're, I think you're right. Um, it's a very different so board gender diversity, as you say. It's it's um, it's needed. Uh, you know, t- twenty five years ago, most boards of big public companies in America were uh, insiders, uh, executives of the company, uh, older, white, and male. Um, I, I just happen to be doing a study. If you take the Nike board in nineteen ninety seven, not the thirteen people, all but two were that description. Uh, one was Japanese American, and they had, they had one female. Fast forward today, they, they've, it's still 13. There are four women 
and four people of color. Uh, and none, all but one person is an outsider. Um, and all but two, because I think Phil Knight is on, on the board. So we've, we've changed the composition of the board dramatically. And there's undoubtedly still need, especially in some boards, for a little more of that um, diversity. But And I think that's all exactly right and good. But I also agree with you, or at least the, the implication that I was taking, that it, it, it's, it's, it's critical to promote that inclusiveness, uh, to use a popular word. But it, it, it might tip to say you have to have three of this color and two of this gender and one of this yeah. sexual orientation. Yeah. That, that gets it, it, it's. And I, I think, you know, it's unfortunate that some people think that's how you have to design a board. Um, I, I would rather have it much more organic looking. And I, I disagree with you, Lauren, about why you're on the boards. Or what, I, you know, I, you're a supremely talented analytical uh, investor, um, you know, with, with great uh, business well, thank you. Uh, skills. But it's so, a component. And that's what I look for. I mean, I, I've been on boards that went through a process of going from uh, all male to um, 40% or some 30, 30% um, female. And but we did it, and I think this is the way to do it. We, we weren't thinking we need to have five people or six people or seven people out of this number of people. We weren't doing a numerator denominator deal. Um, we were trying to find the very best people, and we made sure we had a net that included all kinds of uh, backgrounds, diversity, uh, gender, race, ethnicity, religion, Aboriginal status. I mean, just, um, and then we picked the best ones. So I think it was a conscious, deliberate uh, ex- search. But then the, the choices were entirely on who will help this company the most at this moment. Yeah. Um, and you know, I know one of the problems with that approach, um, propon- you know, activists, uh, thinkers will say, is it takes too long. It's, you're, you're not going to get parity. Um, you know, we've already been working on this. I, I took the case of Nike, you know, 25 years. Um, that's a long time and, and you're still not quite there. Uh, and they're just they're, there's a frustration about about just how long it takes, uh, and and that's you know it's a fair criticism. I think that's where the where, where the debate is. Uh, you know, is, uh, you know the op, the opponents would say that that's enormous progress. You know, on a on a yeah. on a social topic. Um, uh, uh, so it's looking at the identical things and interpreting in totally different ways. Yeah, it's so interesting. So I want to talk to you about two different. Um, topics. They are related. But one, you've written or you've co-authored a book with your wife, Margin of Trust. Can you talk about trust, why it's important to an organization? And also, could you equate that to the insurance industry? I've heard you talk about the consolidation of um, quality businesses, trust-based businesses in the insurance industry, and why you get so many of these CEOs in the insurance industry that are great letter writers and quality shareholders in the insurance industry. Can you tie that together for me a little bit? Yeah, thanks Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for doing that, Lauren. That's really nice. Yeah, to trust is, is critical in, in any relationship, start, starting with the family and Moving into the, the the neighborhoods, the schools, the, the civic dimensions, and in business, um, and uh, you 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 have to be able to rely on on your counterparties, um, or you can't you can't do business. There's no way we can pre-commit to handle every possible situation from now till doomsday in, in some exquisite way. We have to appreciate that as things change. As adversity comes, we will both need to pivot or adjust or change this relationship. And so, ex ante, when you're starting a relationship, the, the only the only way uh, it's going to succeed is if you have a degree of trust, so that you can fluidly uh, rely upon each other and and and, and work things out. Uh, so it's it's a critical feature, and many of the most important um, Economic events in, in history were done on a handshake, on, done on, a, on on trust, you know, without elaborate commitments or contracts or, or written agreements um, go, going back to the to the railroads and, and even you know through large business transactions through the 60s or, or 70s. Um, and and so it's critical to have trust. It's critical at that high level. It's also critical when you're hiring a, a workforce, training them that we are Thinking as a team that I will help you understand how to how to perform these functions, and then you will 
contribute that value to this organization and not go uh, spill the trade secrets and, and go into competition with, with me somewhere else. So there, the, the sense of trust is, is critical in all businesses. In America, in the past 20 or 30 years, the, the culture has tended to defy the importance of trust by increasingly emphasizes, emphasizing mechanisms of control. Uh, hierarchical arrangements where people are given very defined functions and very specific orders and with little or no discretion or autonomy to to pivot or adjust as circumstances require. Um, significant um, lines of reporting authority have been designed to promote uh, accountability, which ends up er eroding uh, trust. Uh, and so it, it, it begins to harm the, the functioning, the prosperity of, of the organization, the sense of loyalty people might feel, the sense of fidelity, the sense of team, the sense that we're, we're in this together. Uh, and so, you know, there's an optimal point within any organization about what, what's the right mix between trust and control, between giving people discretion and, and having bounded bounded authority. So you know, where that balance is or how to, how to dial it varies from, from company to company. Uh, as a macro matter, when I just look out at the, the overall system, uh, it's pretty clear that the general dialing has been towards control and away from trust. Uh, then there, are, so within that framework, that you can then identify exceptions, uh, organizations that still rely very heavily on trust. Uh, and the examples that I include in that book with with Stephanie, my wife, margin of trust, um, uh, are the, the common exceptions are large. Um, conglomerations of diverse businesses under single roofs where the organization is, when it's organized into decentralized components, where the managers of the different business units have significant autonomy to call the shots about products, customers, pricing, and, and even capital reinvestment. Uh, and, exempt, and, and the reason is because in that, in that kind of setting, in a large diverse organization, it's even more important to grant people decision-making authority over topics where they know best. Uh, and the exemplar for this is Berkshire Hathaway. Warren Buffett sitting at the top of over 80 different operating subsidiaries. He would have no idea how to operate any of those businesses. He, he would not know how to price an insurance policy at Geico or, or think about product innovation in the candy business or, or how to how to build uh, the, the, you know, the uh, recreational vehicles or, or construct a a, a mobile home wouldn't have the first idea. So he has to rely on people who are running those businesses to make those those calls. But the only way he can do that is if he trusts those people and they therefore have to be trustworthy. So he's incubated in a, a thick, rich, deep culture of trust throughout Berkshire Hathaway. So they don't have uh, command and control, lines of reporting authority or, or tight job descriptions. That they, 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 they have some framework and some limitations and allocations or lanes, if you will. Uh, but within them, people have broad autonomy. Uh, and the result of that, the, the economic, the academic literature tends to show that employees in trust-based organizations tend to excel. They perform better. Um, they're more productive. They're, they they have fewer sick days, uh, fewer um, injuries. <laughs> so um, so the model is it remains very attractive, even though the pendulum has swung. So in that book, we identified I think thirty or so other companies. You know, we went out and tried to investigate directly and indirectly um, you know, the degrees of trust versus control in a large number of, of companies. We said we found about thirty that really clearly um, dialed towards trust. And so we, we have a bunch of examples uh, in there. Uh, Danaher is a good example. Um, Google or uh, Alphabet, now the, the parent of Google. Um, and as as we did, and, 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 and several other uh, in, industrial companies of, of that sort. But what, what struck us, this comes to the second part of your question, was the density of insurance companies in this cohort of trust-based cultures. And so we wonder why insurance companies might have a greater propensity to in, in, embed their organizations with trust, to use trust more than control. And our thesis was that, well, insurance itself as a, as a business relies almost entirely on trust. The, the product is a promise to pay money when a disaster, when some event 
the curse. That's all it is. And so it, it's essentially a, a a trust business. I mean, it's very different from candy or housing or, or a T-shirt where, you, you know, you. I guess there's some qualitative representation about it, its taste or durability. But with with uh, with insurance, it's it's just a promise. Um, it's it's one's word. I mean, it's written on a piece of paper and there are exclusions and deductibles and limitations. But nevertheless, that's what's being bought and sold. So I think insurance people may, uh, as a matter of the business, um, uh, accept and and believe uh, in trust to a, a greater degree than a, a manufacturing or a retailing company. And then the other half of it is on the investment side, that insurance companies hold funds of others between the time they receive a premiums and pay a claim, and they have to invest that money. Uh, and so they are born fiduciaries. They, they're trustees of their policyholders' funds. And so they've got to invest under under prudential regulations, huge slugs in, in fixed in, income securities, but, but typically will have additional capital to invest in, in equities or in some cases, uh, outright ownership of uh, operating businesses. And they've found that you know, that that's a trust based activity, too, that they are stewards, to use a word I know Templeton Phillips likes, uh, uh, of of policyholders capital and they are stewards of their their own shareholders capital. And so I think that that trust is inherent in that that part of the insurance business, too. So that's our that's our hypothesis. It's it's, it's more it's, it's an assertion, not not something we empirically prove, but we think there's. You know, a, a good intuitive case, and and that's certainly what we've observed in in a pretty decent sample. How do you think about measuring trust? Is it simply the lack of control, or what what is a good way for investors to think about measuring trust within an organization? Is it in their corporate values? Yeah, it's it, measuring is very difficult. It's it, it's like measuring a moat. It, it's so we we can articulate the the theme. Uh, there may be some inferential ways to measure it. So it's the the absence of certain designated systems of internal control and accountability, uh, and so it might be features such as the degree of of um, centralized um, policy making versus decentralized delegation, and then sort of the numbers of direct reports that people down the organization have. The policies regarding um, capital allocation in particular, to what extent are the managers who are generating uh, returns required to um, dividend that upstream or permitted to redeploy it on their own? So you would start looking at who is making acquisition decisions. Uh, are, are they always done at headquarters or are they tuck in and add ons, things that are clearly being done? Um, by managers in the field, in the industry, rather than from headquarters. And so, and to come back, Lauren, you know, to your shareholder letters, um, that's an excellent place to look. You can get, I mean, managers will give signals if not, if they're not even just, just, just express about it. And, and, and they're, and so you can discern from, from that, what level, what, you know, where the dials are between trust and control. And I hasten to add, you know, Managers who are skeptical of trust are perfectly intelligent and sound, and it may, may be right uh, that they need a lot of command and control, and they cannot have any leakage, and they cannot, cannot afford any deviation. I'm not saying it's a terrible model or, or, or that a business run that way is not a good investment, um, but uh, there, there are trade-offs uh, on, on both sides, and it is useful as you develop a, a portrait of a company and whether it's right for you. Uh, in, in terms of the economics and the sort of the culture, uh, I think it's useful to think about that, that the, the role of trust in the organization. Sure. I mean, it seems like if you're not going to have a bureaucratic organization, you're going to delegate authority that and have this culture of trust, it's really important who you're in business with. So you better be a pretty good judge of character, corporate um cultural values are start are going to start to play an important role for companies like that is the way I see it. Can you talk a little bit about, you've already written a book, you've also written a book about um, Berkshire Beyond Buffett. And I'm curious for you to share 
those thoughts with listeners. And another important thing is the role of, of trust in thinking about um, succession. And the critical thing about, about trust in that setting is that um, the number one um, job, let's say, of a board of directors, I, I would say, is is picking the CEO. And if you do a good job picking the CEO, then you, you won't have many other problems. Um, if you do a bad job, you're going to have <laughs> endless problems. But it's equally important to um, have that number two in place, have, have the successor in, in place. Um, and that's where, where trust is, is critical. So if Warren fell over tomorrow, who would take over? And, and every, I mean, it takes a leap of faith for any of us um, to think that that will be okay, that we will survive uh, and be prosper. So, um, so that number two is, um, is critical and it's a perfect illustration of, of the importance of, of trust, you know, all around. And um, so in, um, you know, and, and, and today we, there are very good visible plans for succession uh, at, at Berkshire. Um, and that book, Berkshire Beyond Buffett, was, was about that succession. It was about, well, how, how will a company like this survive Warren Buffett leaving the scene? Because so many people think it's, it's you know, he's the oracle and the, and, and the, the the magician, you know, at the top, who, whose absence would just d- destroy the company or in, in some way. Uh, and so that book was an attempt to show that that to to debunk that myth that is that is as vital as unique as as indispensable, irreplaceable as he is. Um, the organization, and including its its trust based culture, is larger than any one person, and it will survive. Even the departure of that, you know, uh, dominant, dominant, dominant figure, uh, and so you know, and and I think the key to the succession plan is, and, and its practicality is that Warren's role will be divided into four parts. He's basically had four jobs. Um, he's been the chairman, the CEO, the CIO, and the and the largest shareholder, and so. Each of those roles has to be thought of in a succession plan. The CEO job is likely to go to the Greg Abel, who now runs the energy business. The chairman job is most likely to go to Howard Buffett, Warren's son, or if not him, then Susan Buffett, his daughter, both of whom are on the board and have obviously Buffett DNA. Uh, and a CIO job, the chief investment officer job, will be shared by two incumbents who manage sub portfolios at Berkshire, Ted. Um, Weschler and Todd Coombs. So those are, and that's about, you know, they're all wonderful people. None of them is Warren Buffett. No one will do as good a job. Um, there won't be anything like what it's been, um, but all extremely competent, capable, and will be able to, you know, main, maintain the ship of state. Uh, the shareholder group is a little different. Uh, Warren's a controlling shareholder. And so, you know, even the ETFs or the, the, the index funds, the activists um, have not been able to dent uh the governance structure or the per, or the culture of, of Berkshire Hathaway. Um, but when he's gone, they might have a different agenda and economic activists might want to pounce and you know com- seek to have a cash dividend paid or to divest subsidiaries that aren't aren't performing. And so um, that, that's probably the, the trickiest area. Um, I think the, the good news is that there is a significant uh, group of holders of the class A stock so that after his after his death, all of his class A, which is the higher voting stock, gets converted into B, which is low voting, and then sold out into the market and then um, by the Gates Foundation, which then donates the money somewhere. So these A's all disappear. Uh, and then the other A's will have s- slightly greater voting power. Um, so there's still some significant uh, quality shareholder ownership of Berkshire which is nice, but it's still not the same as having one single individual with the iconic power of Warren. Um, but so, so it's a complicated succession plan and it's, it's critical. So I look at Berkshire today and who are the people and what are they likely uh, going to need to do? And, and I think it's an excellent group um, because the main thing they're going to need to do uh, after appointing the successor CEO is 
defend that person and defend low, no dividend, no divestitures, um, and defend the cultures and the values. And so, who are the you know those those people are most of them significant shareholders of Berkshire Hathaway, um, having bought the stock with their own money, uh, uh, or managing funds that bought the stock and didn't receive it as a grant or an option. Um, people who have owned that stock for a very long time, people who understand the, the you know, why the, the, the capital allocation policy results in no dividend payments, why the permanent time horizon uh, philosophy results in not the, you know, divesting very few, hard, hardly any businesses. You know. So they, they will understand these points and be able to report them and argue them. And so while the, the, the State Streets and the Black Rocks may not have the capacity to, to listen, uh, enough others will that I think that, that they will be able to um, sustain uh, the organization uh, long after Warren leaves the scene. Yeah, and Berkshire directors are not compensated. Right. It's uh, maybe a couple thousand dollars or seven thousand dollars. And they're certainly you know, not doing it for that money. Um, it's uh, a sense, especially the ones. And by the way, when I say they own substantial positions, um, I'm, I'm thinking primarily in, in relation to their own net worth. So it's not as if anyone has five percent or ten percent or something, but um, as a percentage of their of, of the overall company, but as a percentage of their own portfolio or their own net worth, um, it's all meaningful or or more. And they're doing that <clears throat> doing that job. Uh, not for their own, you know, uh, personal income or you know, getting that stipend, uh, but because they believe in Berkshire Hathaway and and they want to protect the company and its shareholders um, as faithful stewards, and and that's 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 the real sense I get from from who they are. I agree. I I, I definitely get that sense from the director. So I'm going to ask you one difficult question. You serve as a director of some organizations. Markel is one. Um, are you still on the board of Constellation Software? Do you think directors should be? I'm on the board of several companies, I should say, myself, Fairfax Financial, Fairfax India, and Canadian Solar. What do you think about director compensation? Well, I, I think a, a, you know a fair fair compensation for for the the wisdom, uh, the time, attention, and energy is appropriate. Um, you know, I, I think I think it's hard. No one does what Berkshire does. I actually just did did a study. No one pays less than ten thousand dollars. I mean, the lowest among the S and P five hundred is, or besides Warren, besides Berkshire, is around two hundred. Um, now there's so also at the other end of the spectrum, there are some what I consider um, unreasonably high. <laughs> uh, there's one that's two million dollars. There's one that's one million. Whoa! To me, to me, this is out of out of sight. But those outliers aside, the band. And, and, and at, there's a congregation of um, companies where the directors are, are paid close to in, in the high 400s. But the sort of the typical one is around 300. And for that, you know, and, and it's paid partly in cash, um, about a third, partly in stock. Stock is typically got to be held for some years. Um, and And so... Is this reasonable? I mean, the, the market has certainly signaled that that within that band it is reasonable. Um, I don't have any any quarrel with the market with with that. I recognize, uh, and also those figures have all increased just above the rate, uh, higher than the rate of inflation. They're, they're not galloping, oh, but they're, they've been increasing yeah. um, over decade to decade. And and I I think directors have been asked to do a lot more and, and shoulder a lot more burden and risk in terms of uh, reputation, in terms of time, uh, you know, decade by decade. Uh, the, the current agenda is extremely full. So it's not a full-time job, but it's it's an alertness and you always have to be prepared. There are meetings called uh, on short notice, late at night, on weekends, and you really can't miss um 
a meeting. I mean, it's all publicized and reported out That's in the right. proxy statements and the, the proxy advisors will pounce. And so you, yes, you know, they will <laughs> recommend a vote against you. So I, I, I think that there are, pro there are probably some, some excesses and, and, you know, and there's some extremes like there are in a lot of markets, but, you know, sort of overall band seems, uh, seems fair and reasonable. Um, I think the trickiest thing there, Lauren, and I, I wrote a little piece on this is uh, who sets it. Uh, at, you know, because there's really nobody other than the board itself that can set the board's compensation, setting That's up an right. inherent conflict of interest, which we're yeah. supposed to all avoid. And so I wrote this piece about, well, how, how do you get around that? And um, I mean, the courts will even say that's a conflict of interest that the court is going to second is going to scrutinize the decision for fairness, which you know, courts usually defer to the business judgment of directors on almost all topics. Um, but on setting their own pay, the courts have said we're going to have a second look. You know, we'll second guess the judgment. So I, 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 I explain to boards the best. Um, there are two things you should do. One is make sure that you're within that range of reasonableness. You know, I, I discourage people from going up. You know, I'd even say you know try to be just below, you know you don't want to be a leader you know, in that particular area. Uh, you know, and the and the other is is to try to design internal systems where um, people are not voting on their own pay. You've got some some committee that is um, uh, is independent. As but that would be a committee of the board, right? I yeah, mean, that's the compensation committee on the yeah, board. Yeah, that's typically who would do it. You know, and then um, uh, you know I, that doesn't quite because there are still going to be people on that committee who are having this problem. And so I, I explore some um, creative strategies there where uh, it might be that uh, uh, you have some some directors be, are willing to serve at no pay or, or at, at below market pay. And because they own a lot of stock in the company or they've been there a long time or for some other reason, and you entrust the decision making to them. Uh, it's it's a you know these are subtle and and very firm specific kinds of things because it depends entirely on the character of that person the personality of the other people involved and so it's a it's certainly a case by case um, question but you know sort of an answer to your question is I, I think directors are entitled to reasonable compensation for you know, some very difficult work in many cases and um, uh, and they do they they do have to act you know, as, as strict fiduciaries in, in determining what that, what that level is. It's a big time commitment for sure. So do you think if you screened companies on director compensation or CEO compensation, that would be a good, I don't know, short screen or a good screen for? Yes, I, I think it's a signal. And I, I think, uh, you know, I did some research for the quality shareholders uh, initiative that, that probed this point and, and quality shareholders um, uh, will will look at, at this topic, take it seriously, because after all, the directors are their ambassadors, their their representatives, um, and so understanding their incentives are is is critical. And, and what I've seen is a view that suggests that um, it's attractive to see directors uh, own stock in the company, um, ideally through their purchase with with their own cash, uh, and that's and it's perfectly fine for that to be a a stipend for serving on the board, paid in cash, but that, that they then use to buy the stock. Um, and so, the theory and Warren has used the quote that in that case the directors will really walk in the shoes of the owners. So they're buying, they're eating their own cooking. They're, they're buying the stock with their own money, and I I am. Uh, a, a, a supporter of that of that approach. Uh, and, um, I, I, I may not always be the most popular director on any given board, but any given board that I'm on, I would encourage. I would I would support a policy that said we we're paid, but then we we should or um, must uh, use that money to buy the stock. <laughs> sure. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Well, this has been a very interesting conversation and we've been recording for about an hour and a half. So we really enjoyed the conversation. We appreciate your time so much. Scott, did you have any follow-up questions or? No, I thought um, that was excellent. 
A lot of great information. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to getting the recording back to you. And uh, we really appreciate your time. This has been an enjoyable conversation. Well, it's my pleasure, both of you. I I, I enjoyed our conversation, too. And I'm I'm honored to, to participate. Yeah. It was fun. My dog actually threw up right next to me about 15 minutes into Aww, the conversation. That little doggy. And now she's tired. She's just laying down. Uh, so I'm yeah, sitting I here next dog. to here, a drink. big pile of Come vomit. Here. Oh, really? Oh, my God. You got to go get that. Come here, drink. Just, I'm going to put you on TV like that. Luckily, it doesn't smell. Let's see. Let's get see. Up here. Come on, drink. What is it? Uh, oh. Look over here. Who is this? Oh, is it a schnauzer? It, this is a, a um, golden a doodle. doodle. So it's a mix, oh, it's even a though doodle. she's black, golden retriever and poodle. Yeah. And she yeah. just woke this up. So is she... a, <laughs> this is a retriever. Nice. So it's an oh, English okay. cream and Beautiful. its breeder does doodles. So That's great. I guess, yeah, he's the retriever part of the doodle. That's, That's awesome. Nice. What is this dog's name? Journey. A journey. Yeah, Are she's you a journey three. fan? What? Are you a journey fan? Yeah, it, that was my part of it. I, I like the music. <laughs> um, my girls or kids thought it was because yeah, that's a common word people use today about you're on some journey to some discovery. Yeah. <laughs> okay, got it. Got it. Well, I'm I a journey I don't, fan too. I don't actually like the use of that word in that context. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing you in person at one of these AGMs one of these times. Okay. All right. Thanks so much. Bye. Thanks, Larry. Bye.